Amazing grace. Praise the Lord. But I had in my heart, be not afraid of sudden fear, neither the desolation of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord shall be your safety and will keep your feet, your foot from being taken. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Father, I pray this morning for any person that might have trepidation, might have an uneasiness, that might be afraid, that might be scared. Father, we thank you that there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. So, Lord, we thank you that your perfect love casts that fear out, and you are here with us, your presence, your goodness, your manifestation. We trust you, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And anyone who agreed said? Amen. 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 No fear here. Everybody say, no fear here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lawrence. Good. Thank you. Hey, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to those of you that are watching with us online. We're grateful to have you with us, to have you watching, and uh, we're in the uh, second week of a subject that I present consistently, and I personally enjoy it, but uh, for some it might bring fear or a little uneasiness, and that's why we say God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, and that also, uh, be not afraid of sudden fear when it comes. That's Proverbs 1, I believe it is. No, Proverbs 3. Be not afraid of sudden fear. Hey, everybody gets jolted once in a while where you get maybe a shock or just, a, uh, it, just something happens to you. But Scripture says in those instances, be not afraid of sudden fear. For the Lord will be your strength, will protect you and keep you and hold you. And so we, uh, as a Christian church, uh, one of the the great truths of the Bible is that God has not given us fear. Fear is not of God. And so if something comes on you where all of a sudden you get uneasy or you get disquieted or, you know, the, uh, the psalmist said, why art thou disquieted within me? Why am I uncomfortable? Why am I... Uh, nervous? Why am I upset? Why am I flat out? Why am I afraid? I'm going to say no. I may, my, I may even put my hands up and go no to fear because the scripture says, and within the scripture is the power to change your disposition. So God has not given me a spirit of fear. Praise God. I believe that 100%. Uh, and he's given me a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. Hey, look at that. Power Love and in a sound mind. You guys get love twice. You get power in a sound mind. You get power in a sound mind. And the love is right in the middle here. So praise God. But hey, perfect love casts out fear. Praise the Lord. So we're, we're standing on the Word of God today. We're trusting the Word of God. And we're grateful for the Word of God. So um, this uh, second week of we're talking from the... Well, I, let me just start out by saying the same thing I said last week. Let's say, what time is it? Amen. Is it state fair time? No, you don't have to repeat that, Pastor Nance. Thank you. All right. That's okay. You're, this is it, you're interactive. She's used to being up here with me on Wednesday nights, and so she's talking back and forth with me. Thank you very much. But what time is it? It's not state fair time. It is, yeah. It's not back to school time. Yeah, it is back to school time. It's not biking season yet for me or for those who care. Uh, not yet, next week. But uh, September generally is Bible festival time. Yes. Bible festival time, which occurs each fall, again, usually in September. And it is the Jewish Hebrew calendar that we're watching as we follow closely uh, as Christians. And it's followed all over the world. And so uh, for probably... Uh, as long as I've been a Christian, this has been a topic of interest for me because uh, when I got saved uh, back in the 60s, uh, 60s, 70, 80, 90, 2000, 10, 20, 30, uh, wow, that's a long time ago. All right, so I read, I read Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and that book, when it came out, it uh, scared me, and I 
humbled myself and I accepted Christ. And so for, the, for, for all those years, uh, it's a book about prophecy, and uh, I've been waiting and watching the horizon, uh, the panorama of things in the Bible, expecting that at some point uh, what is predicted in Scripture is going to happen. And so I want to uh, say two things. I want to say don't be afraid of end-time prophecy because I read it in the 60s and I'm still here. And so, so and who knows how long it may be. But on the other hand, uh, we watch and we watch the, the uh, signs of the times. We're, we're paying attention. We're very aware of everything that's going on around us. And as the world continues to roll or spin or uh, spin out of control, frankly, as we watch it happen, we know that we have the peace of God that passes understanding to rule and guard our heart and our mind, yeah. to rule and guard our heart and our mind through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so I can be strong in the Lord. I can cast down and imaginations. Every Christian is called to cast down imaginations and anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring our thoughts to, into captivity. And so when I get to be, a, when I'm afraid, if something happens in the earth or something happens in the world or something happens in the family or something, and things have happened this week in the family that are frightening, and yet I know better than to let fear get a hold of me. So what we do is we, we, we rotate that fear out and we rotate in faith. We stand in faith. We declare the desired end result. We've taught for years and years and years that Christians should speak the desired end result when fear comes, when something bad happens, when things don't go our way. We, out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth does speak and we say what we want to happen simply because we believe in faith. We believe in the, that what the book of Proverbs teaches us, that there is power in the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. The Bible talks about the tongue, the lips, the mouth, the words, all over Proverbs, and anybody that wants to fully comprehend or understand and start the subject of what we're talking about. If you're a young Christian, a new Christian, or someone who's never heard this before, you can go back to Proverbs, and you take your four marker colors, and you, you, you mark one, the tongue, in one, uh, the lips in another, the mouth in another, and words. And when you see those four different colors in your Bible, in the book of Proverbs, you go, that's incredible how much the wis book of wisdom teaches us about what we say, because what you say will affect what you believe, and what you believe is what you're going to stand on. And we want to be people of faith that stand on God's word. And so we're always going to teach you about uh, the tongue, the mouth, the lips, and words, we're, but we're always going to teach you about faith, because faith is is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so we're going to hold fast to our profession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful. Why? Because he's faithful, and so I'm not going to waver. I'm going to stand. I'm going to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Uh, Father, I don't remember if I said a prayer or not, so I'm going to say it one again. But thank you, Lord, for your presence, your goodness, your manifestation in this house today. We thank you for the, the saints that are assembled here and for those that are participating with us out there. And we just thank you for the whole family of God today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're talking about the festivals here in the uh, in. in for the first few weeks of the uh, uh, first few weeks of the month of September, and of course the the spring festivals are Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. And so, uh, first of all, someone may go, well, "Why would a New Testament Christian be interested in the festivals that are found in the Old Testament?" And here's the answer, and you need to accept this and grasp it right now. Jesus fulfilled the festivals in the spring. Jesus perfectly fulfilled the festivals in the spring. So I know that if Jesus fulfilled them, it wasn't happenstance, it wasn't coincidence, it wasn't weird, it wasn't anything except it was preordained from the foundation of the world that Jesus Christ would come to earth and fulfill those spring festivals. Well, in the same manner, he's going to fulfill the fall festivals of Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, uh, Sukkot, he's going to fulfill them. There is a day coming, and we watch. The Bible says to watch and to know the signs of the times, 
to be aware of where we are on God's time clock. Uh, let me just say, back in the 60s, I thought we were there. That's a long time ago to be, believe, to be believing God to come back. And yet we're all still here. 2023, I have to think about what the date is, 23. So, but the promises of God are yes and amen. The promises, for some of us who believe prophecy is promises, God has promised that he will come back. And the reason that I'm, I'm excited about promises of Christ coming back is because I'm not afraid of the future. I'm not afraid of eternity. I'm not afraid of standing before the Lord. Uh, you know, there, there, are, uh, there are the, 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 the goats and the, and the uh, sheep and the goats judgments, things that you see in, in the book of, uh, in the book of um, first book of the New Testament is Matthew. Uh, I, I figured it out in a second. But, and there were, there were, you know, we recognize that there are things that, you know, you or I may not be too proud of in our life, but hey, praise God, if, if the truth of the word is the truth of the word, then the Bible says old things have passed away, all things are new, and that if we confess our sin, the Apostle John said, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, east, you remember our sins no more. So if I stand in faith on the forgiveness and the blood of Jesus, then I, when I stand before him and I go into the eternal age, there's something awaiting me as a faithful Christian. Because brothers and sisters, you are faithful Christians. Those of you that are tuning in today, many Christians don't participate in normal Christianity today. And that's a question mark for me, question mark. Because if they don't participate in normal Christianity, what is normal Christianity? Well, you got a Bible. That's numero uno, number one, that you have a Bible and that you read your Bible, that you know some of the stuff that it says in there, and you have a favorite place to read, and you know the New Testament, you know Jesus in the, in the Gospels, and you the Apostle Paul's writing, and Peter, James, and John in the book of Revelation, Genesis to Revelation. You have a Bible. Christians have Bibles. They're not somewhere where they're buried in a, in a bag of books somewhere or a box of books somewhere that you haven't seen your Bible. No, modern Christianity, I don't know, do they... Okay, I'm not... I don't want to go there, but we as Christians in this church, we do read Amen. our Bible and our, our desire is to read our Bible every day. Amen. To seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto us. So we're paying attention to the festivals, and generally they, the festivals, they, sometimes they can fall, they can start in late uh, August, and sometimes even run into October, but generally the time frame is September. And as we look at this September calendar, we're paying attention to the festivals of the fall because all again, I say this again, that all the spring festivals were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And so if we accept this truth right here that everything is fulfilled in Jesus Christ, then the fall festivals, even though they are Jewish, even though they were given to the children of Israel, even though they're Old Testament, Jesus Christ will fulfill the fall festivals by his return and by his gathering the church and to take us with him into heaven with us. We call it the rapture of the church, or the Bible says, uh, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, in the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with him forever. And so this is an event that the Apostle Paul tells us about, that Jesus told us about. Jesus didn't give us clear specificity because he was talking to the Jews of the day, but then later on in, in, the, in the New Testament, we see Jesus' words that are amplified by Peter and John and Paul. And so we understand that it's all here for us to know. It's in the Bible for us to know. And so we are paying attention with, uh, with, a, with, a, with an excitement. And, and I pray right now for those of you over here and those of you over here and those of you over here and those of you over here to have some excitement about this idea. Maybe you say, well, well I, 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 I'm just about ready to buy this brand new car. 
or I'm about ready to move into my new place, or my children are just about grown and out of the house, or my kids are going to graduate from school or whatever. All these, everybody has something. We all do. We want to see the conclusion of the matter. Solomon said what the conclusion of the matter, but the point is, is that there's something always out on the horizon that we go, I want to see that happen. But at some point, Christ will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God will sound, the dead in Christ will rise. First is what the apostle Paul clearly defined for us, that the graves will empty out of Christians. Now the dead outside of Christ are going to stay and buried, but the dead in Christ shall rise first to collect their bodies to meet the Lord in the air. As we go up, they go up, and we will all be gathered together to meet the Lord in the air. Jesus is going to come in the clouds of glory. He's going to gather up his church, and he's going to take us back to heaven for a seven-year celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb and the feast in heaven, and the Christians are going to rejoice, and all hell is going to break loose on earth. And that's where the frightening part of this whole equation comes from is that the, all hell breaks loose when we're gone. So you and I aren't going to be here for it. We're not going to see one drop of it. We're going to be celebrating, rejoicing. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, the fourth chapter, hey, John was told about churches, 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 churches. The last church was the church of Laodicea. And at the last verse of the church of the Laodicea, uh, Laodicea uh, chapter 4 of the book of Revelation starts 4-1 a door is open in heaven and a voice from heaven says come up hither and from that point on guess what you are a church you are the church you are the church you are the church we are the church the church isn't mentioned again in the book of revelation after 401 why if the new testament is about the body of christ which is the church why would Revelation not talk about the church anymore? Did God just leave us helpless? Did he just drop us? Did he just say, forget you, I'm going to talk about Israel now, or I'm going to talk about the earth, or I'm going to talk? No. He solved it. He solved it. He came. He got the church. We're not part of the end day equation because we're gone. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take, it, you know, it doesn't, listen, it doesn't take a lot of faith it just read the scripture that we'll present today, hold on to the scripture that we'll present today, and that will propel your faith to believe that you won't be here when all hell breaks loose. And let me tell you something, you and I could figure out without needing the Bible to know that all hell is breaking out in the earth. The world has gotten so weird, the food has gotten so weird, energy has gotten so weird, Politics has gotten so weird. Everything has gotten weird. Now remember, things have been rolling and changing since I read the book a long time ago, that book. And I'm just telling you why it's like a marker. It's to give you some, uh, just to help you to understand how long I've been looking for this. Some of you have just heard recently about end time doctrine from scripture and you're scratching your head and you're going, wow, should I believe this or should I not? You know, because there's many churches that don't touch this. Many churches don't, don't believe this. But here's the reason we believe it. Because Jesus said it. Amen. Because Paul said it. Because John said it. Because Peter said it. Because all the Bible says it from Genesis to Revelation. In Genesis, there are prophecies of Christ that are found in the book of Genesis all the way through into the New Testament. And we know without a doubt as believers in Jesus Christ that the Bible predicts a day that, like I said several times, I'll say it again, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, Hey! Yo, maybe it's modern. Yo, I'm coming, I'm here. The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. Doot, 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 whatever you want to say. Brian, are you playing that day? You'll probably be playing the horn that day. He'll blow that horn. But that horn will sound like nothing you've ever heard. And in the twinkling of an eye, Apostle Paul said, it's the twinkling of an eye. My snap wasn't fast enough for you to be gone. In the twinkling of an eye, the righteous will, the dead in Christ, I said this, I'm going to say it again, someone needs to hear this. 
The dead in Christ will rise first. Why? Because they got a little farther to go. A couple <laughs> feet, couple feet, they're a couple feet. They just in a, because, because it's already over. It's over. Twinkling of an eye. When they, when they, uh, when they measure twinkling, it goes into, it's an amazing study. Look at, look at twinkling of an eye in, uh, in, the, in, the Corinth, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, the word that Paul used there is an atom of time. An atom of time. Well, how could Paul know about atoms of time? The word is A-T-O-M-O-S, atomos, atomos, whatever you want. But it means an atom. So Paul was told by Christ about an atom when he had no idea about atoms. How could Paul in his day know about atoms? But it's in an atom of time. So the atomic clock won't even get a chance to click when Christ will receive the church for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the marriage supper of the Lamb takes us back and it, it reminds us, it reminds us of, of Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. And they waited for the bridegroom with oil in their lamps. And so right now, as Christians who come to church, you're getting some oil in your lamp. 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 lamp. And if I stay away from church... You're getting some oil in your lamp. And if I stay away from church and, I, and my Bible's buried somewhere and I'm not hearing it on the radio or I'm not watching it on TV or I'm not getting any, any kind of Christianity in my life, my oil level's going down. Hey, have you checked the oil in your car lately? Why should I do that? Because the engine will stop if you don't have oil. So oil is a critical, critical component of our life. If anybody, or in, in other areas, if you know, if you got a lamp, you need to keep the oil burning in the lamp. But in the context of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said there were 10 of them that all had oil. Everybody had oil. But when the bridegroom didn't come, when everybody thought he would. Haven't we all thought that, hey, Jesus will be here by now. I thought that back in 67, man. So I'm telling you something. We've been waiting for Jesus this long. And I don't have a problem, not one. I don't feel like God did me wrong. I don't feel like I was misled. I've been taught to watch. We're watchers. Watch for the the signs of the times, Jesus said. I'm paying attention. I'm watching the sky. I'm watching the earth. I'm watching uh, politics. I'm watching uh, finance. I'm watching uh, the churches. I'm watching Christians who were not that long ago on fire for God because they heard the message that Jesus is coming soon and they were just like those, those five of those virgins. They got excited. Hey, Jesus is coming. I got some oil. Let's wait for the bridegroom. He's coming. But when the bridegroom tarried, when the bridegroom was slow, when the bridegroom didn't arrive, when I thought he would, I'm telling you, 67 is when I thought Jesus was coming back. I'm not disrupted. I'm not discouraged. I'm not, I didn't lose my hope. I didn't lose my faith. I didn't quit. I didn't give up. I mean, there are times I bounced around in my faith, but praise God when I got amongst people like you guys, all of a sudden I stayed pumped up because we pump it up. Yeah. You know what? We, we don't, we don't, we don't hang around with naysayers and, and people filled with fear and the people that got one foot in the world and one foot in the church and one of the people that are, that are uh, doing drugs and drinking and partying and doing all the things that the world does. They don't, know where, they don't know where the Bible is. They haven't read their Bible. They haven't been to church. But, oh, yeah, I'm saved. Do you know how many people I've talked to lately or heard about that said, of course I'm saved? You're saved? I don't say that to them. But I know you. There's got to be some fruit. There's got to be some evidence. Yeah, but pastor, we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves as a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not of works, but still, hey. We're saved. 
Hallelujah. All right, so, wow, that was an introduction. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> it's festival time. And in these festivals, again, let me just, let me just reiterate the, the idea. Incredible, incredible. The, the way Scripture is fulfilled. God is perfect, and Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Passover in the spring. It's a Jewish festival. Somebody's going, I don't care about Jewish festivals. Just understand that Christ fulfilled them perfectly because Jesus was our Passover sacrifice for us. That Jesus, on the day that uh, the Old Testament priests were slaying the lambs, the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world was put to death and he was put in the grave. Now, now we're going to get into controversy. I can't help it because I always touch on this when I talk about when Jesus died. Let me just present the equation. Tradition is said Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But my Bible continually tells me three days and three nights, and you can't fit that into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so I put on the board for, for years that it was the equation of when Jesus died. Because in order to fulfill prophecy, he had to spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus, then, if just follow me with this idea, if we work backwards from when he was raised from the dead and when, when, he, when he showed up, if we work backwards from there, then on Wednesday when the priests were at the temple and they were, uh, they were taking all the lambs for the Passover feast, Christ was being judged at 6 o'clock in the morning. He was pronounced guilty. And that by 9 o'clock, he was already gone out to the cross. And by noon, the, the darkness set in on the earth. And by 3 o'clock, Jesus Christ was dead. And he was put in the tomb. Why? Because he had a date to keep, which was the, the sundown of the next festival of unleavened bread, which was the next day. And then the following day was the weekly Sabbath. And then uh, after the weekly Sabbath, the Bible says after the Sabbath, on the first day of the week, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And so we understand that as our Passover lamb, Paul said he's the Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us. All right, so Jesus Christ fulfilled Passover. Unleavened bread. Could Jesus fulfill unleavened bread? Now, I'm talking about the Old Testament festivals, and I'm going somewhere with this. If Jesus Christ could fulfill unleavened bread, it means he was sinless, he never sinned, he was the bread of life, the sinless, spotless lamb of God, and so he fulfilled the lamb, he fulfilled uh, Passover, he fulfilled unleavened bread, which has no sin, he fulfilled the weekly Sabbath, which was a sundown on uh, our Friday night, he fulfilled that by being in the grave during that time, and then he fulfilled first fruits. So if he fulfilled first fruits and he rose from the dead and Jesus Christ has now fulfilled the spring festivals, then there are fall festivals that why would he fulfill the spring if he's not going to fulfill the fall? And if he fulfills the fall, how does that fit in with things? Well, for Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, the Bible says the Apostle Paul made it crystal clear. The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be risen. Because Jesus, the Lord himself, shall descend from heaven. I think this is the third time I'm saying this. He shall descend from heaven. Hey, where's heaven? God, there's some awesome speculation lately. I mean, people have just gone off the rocker with, with ideas. But regardless where heaven is, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. That's what the Bible tells us right now. But there's a moment when he and the Father are in agreement. Jesus comes in the air to gather his church. He does not set down on earth. He stays in the air I said this probably four times now. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those that have already come up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with him. At that point, eternity. Right now, I have a date. I have a clock. Right now, 
I'm in, I'm on a Sunday and of 2023. But when I, when I'm with Christ, the eternal age, now, some of you don't agree with the way I present this, but nevertheless, the, that's the way I look at things. It just helps me in my understanding that at that point, I don't need a clock, I don't need a watch, I don't need a date, because forever's forever, so why do you need to keep time? We'll be with Christ forever and ever. And so, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, let's just look at some of these scriptures here because we're talking about the Feast of Trumpets and, and for Christ to fulfill the Feast of Trumpets, which is a Jewish festival that will happen on the 17th of September, that in, a, in the nation of Israel, they will blow the trumpets, they'll blow the, shofar, they'll sh- blow the shofar when they see the new moon and it will signal the beginning of the new year. But Christ has a way more, well... God established these festivals, but our objective as Christians is to look at the Old Testament and see Christ, how he fit into it and fulfilled it and brought us forward to the point we're at now. And so we are looking for this, 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 this occurrence. This, this, uh, it's called a, a moed or it's a, it's a marker in time. It's probably the most important thing that's ever going to happen to you and I in our life. If, if, we, if, if God doesn't tarry, if God comes back, it'll, it'll, that, that will begin the seven-year clock. Seven years in heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb, the celebration in heaven, while on earth, the book of Revelation, seven years, three and a half, the tribulation, and three and a half, the great tribulation will begin. The seven years of tribulation talked about and that's why I started all this because I said in, in 4.1 that John, at Jesus was talking and uh, John said, I saw, I saw the, the ancient of days. Man, I saw Jesus. And he was brighter than the sun. And he said, write these things. And John is recording these things and, and Jesus is talking about the churches. And, and I, I want to ask you, what church do you fit into? I like to say we're the church at Philadelphia because he commended the church at Philadelphia, but the rest of the churches I have so odd against you, I have odd against you, I have odd against you, I have odd against you. I found there's some things that aren't perfect in my, no, no, we're the church of Philadelphia. Because you kept my word, I'll keep you. Because you kept my word, I'll keep you from the hour that's coming on the world to try them. Jesus said that in Luke, or in Luke 21 and in Matthew that there is a time coming when the earth is going to be tested and tried. But when, when we know according to what the scripture says in 4.1, a door opened in heaven and the apostle John heard the voice say, come up hither, and I go back to the point I made at the beginning. You can't find the church in the book of Revelation after 3, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, in chapter 4, verse 1, the church, or John, representing the church, is called up to heaven, and if we accept that as we are with him when we go up to heaven, at that point, you never hear the church again. Why doesn't God tell us what to do in the tribulation? It's going to be so bad, scary, I don't know what to do, and the Bible doesn't even tell me what to do. Because we're not here. It's a good answer, isn't it? Isn't that the best answer possible? Because we're not here. And so our present presentation here this morning is still on page one, by the way, is that we're not going to be here. And so we believe that the Feast of Trumpets is equivalent in our New Testament understanding that the trumpet's going to sound. In 15 of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says the trumpet will sound. And then we explains uh, several things about what happens. So First uh, Corinthians 15, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And then First Corinthians 5, 2 says, therefore let us keep the feast. See, see so we're not, we're not like, like the, the, we're not like the nation of Israel 
where we keep the feast in that regard. We're not, uh, we're not the kind of, uh, uh, we're not practicing Jews. You know, Jews practice all the, the, the law and all the things they do. But Paul says, keep the feast with sincerity. By being sincere about your lifestyle. Being sincere about the way you think. Being sincere about what you do in private. Can I call you out right now? Can I call somebody out right now? Because we can all, we can all look really saintly on Sunday morning, right? But what we do in private, you know, so that, the, the idea here is that, uh, you know, the Bible says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 8, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So as we move forward in all this stuff, so I can catch up with my notes here, uh, here it is right here. Let's just look at it. Several of these instances that I spoke about in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 54. Now this I say, Paul speaking in the New King James Version, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That just means simply that I can't go to heaven in this body. My body has to change. The structure, the the physiology of my body has to change, and, and I have to put on a glorified body. We all understand glorified bodies because they're perfect. They'll last forever. This body's going to wear out. This body's changing. This body, the hair gets gray, and, and some of the things happen, or some things sag, and you know how some of you know, some of you don't know yet, but you'll find out soon enough. But think, <laughs> things, 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 happen, things happen to us, but we get a glorified body changed forever flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption behold I tell you a mystery which is a secret behold I tell you a secret we shall not all sleep in death but we shall all be changed transformed into our glorified bodies to live forever in the eternal state verse 52 that was my commentary in some of that in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There it is, changed. For the corruptible human must put on incorruptible, glorified bodies, and this mortal must put on immortality. Praise God for immortality. There's no more death after that point. None. Not your cells, not your hair, nothing. No death. To re redeemed from death. For this corruptible must put on incorruption uh, in glorified bodies. This mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. All right, so again, the Apostle Paul tells us how it's going to happen. Here is the best description of how it's going to happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. That's why I do that. I don't know what the sound is going to be pretty cool, I'm sure. Not like my little, like a, like, you know, when a horse is getting ready to get in the gate. That is one of the coolest things there is for me. They Six hours on TV. And they look at the ladies' hats at Churchill Downs, and they, they, everybody's dressed up, and they're just sitting around and partying and everything like this, and they're waiting and waiting and waiting for the race. And then you hear it. And the horses start moving towards the gates, and you're watching the gate because as soon as that last horse. Watch the last horse, the one farthest behind, because as soon as he touches his nose against the gate, the gate opens, and that Kentucky, I'm getting to Kentucky Derby is cool. It's a great race. It's just that it takes five hours to get there for three and a half minutes. <laughs> so you just, what you do is you just you just keep changing back and forth. If you watch TV, I don't know some of you don't. But if you do, you just keep going back there. And when you get close to 5.30 in the afternoon uh, central, which would be 6.30 eastern, and at that point, they're going to do that. They're going to do the sound of the trumpet. The horses will get in the gate. And three minutes later, it's all done. It's all done. But it's, it is fast. It's, it's, it's just awesome, the Kentucky Derby. I love it. So anyways, how did I get talking about that? All right, so... Um, 
All right, so again, we're talking about seven years before the close of this age. And in seven years, without the church on earth, the earth and these geniuses who think they can figure it all out will get to a place that they've almost destroyed the earth. The Bible says the earth will almost be destroyed. And so therefore, the Bible says that at that moment, when all hell is broken loose, where the, the nation of Israel is facing all the armies of Antichrist, Antichrist has been running the world for seven years, well, however long, he, when he comes to power, he will, he will be running, and he'll, he'll go to Israel, and he'll try and take over Jerusalem. He'll try, he will sit in the temple, and he'll say he's God, and then right then, all the, the, the Jews that Jesus said, when you see the de desolation, uh, uh, when you see the desolation, what is it? The abomination. the abomination of desolation, he that reads it, don't wait, don't pack your bag, don't grab your change off the dresser, just head for the hills because all hell is going to break loose. And at that point, the whole earth is going to be just absolutely flipped upside down. And then Jesus, the Bible says, will come back in the clouds with the saints and he will destroy the, the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. And, and with that breath of his mouth, think about this. I, I love this idea. This is, uh, maybe you've heard this before, but all as Jesus has to do, I mean, we're, they're going to destroy the whole earth with smoke and, and, and flames and chemicals and bad air and all that. All as Jesus has to do is one breath and he'll cause a chain reaction and it will cleanse everything. One breath from God will change everything and then the earth will be inhabitable again and so obviously there are things that will happen according to what scripture says but then he will set down on the Mount of Olives and he'll bring the church back from heaven with him and then from that point on we'll go into the eternal age or the thousand year millennial reign of Christ on earth from David's throne in Jerusalem then after that all you know the story that after the thousand years are up, Satan will be loosed for a short time, one more time, and he'll go out through the earth and he'll gather together for battle and it calls it Gog and Magog again. And at that point when, when the, the world that follows him surrounds the church or the righteous that are in Jerusalem and around there and it looks like it's really a bad ending, then Jesus puts down all rebellion once and for all forever and at that point, Satan will be cast into lake of fire forever and ever, or the bottomless pit, whatever, wherever he goes, and he'll be there forever and ever and ever and ever. And the, then we'll go into the eternal age, and we'll stop counting dates at that point. You could keep your dates if you want to, but there's no reason to because it's a world without end. So this is the panorama of what the Bible teaches. I didn't make any of this up. This is all found in Scripture. And the point is, is that we're talking about these festivals. Christians, most times, the body of Christ ignores the nation of Israel uh, because the, the Old Testament has so much law in it. And so we, we ignore Israel, but Israel has a significant part to play. And so we recognize that. But yet in the scripture, we understand what our place is. And here, here's the kicker. If you didn't hear a word I just said, we are not appointed to wrath. God has not appointed us to wrath. There is no wrath. The wrath of God is terrifying to me because the wrath of God or the fire of God or the anger of God consumes the enemy. And man, I don't, hey, keep me out from it, but thank God we're under grace. Uh, we have not experienced the, the, the horror of, of what is going to happen, but, but, the, uh, but God has not appointed us to wrath. That's one of the best blessings there is in the New Testament. So if your life is just being bombarded and you are trying to understand and you're saying God is mad at me and I'm experiencing the wrath of God, he promised that he's not appointed a Christian to wrath. Your wrath stopped here, man. You're, the goodness of God 
It's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. I acknowledge today, and you acknowledge today, I hope you will, that what's going on in my life if someone's going through a really difficult time? It's not the wrath of God. God is the solution. God is not the problem. God knows the end from the beginning. God knows you how to lead you out. God knows you how to show you how to quickly end what you're going through. And someone said, well, I'm going through a marriage and I'm not going to walk out on my husband. I'm not going to walk out on my wife. That means, but I'm, I'm with them for forever and it just seems like nothing gets better and it just gets worse. But praise God, God has solutions for every problem. My finances, I don't know what to do, man. The world has gotten so weird and, and everything costs so much and I don't have enough money. I don't know what I'm going to do. But God has a solution in the word of God. There's answers to every problem and your family, my family, you know what, we got, we've had, we've had our family situations the last week or two get freaked out. I mean, it just freaks, it, if you got, if you got scared, you just go, holy moly, that scared the snot out of me. I'm terrified. Things that are just beyond And I'm not going to tell them about the stuff. That's just stuff going on. But God has not appointed us to wrath. It's not the wrath of God. All of our, all of our family can get straightened out. They know the truth. Pastor Nancy and I trained our boys, the boys up in the way that they should go so that now that they're old, they know the truth. It's their choice to follow Jesus. It's their choice to stay in the word. It's their, hey, Joe and Leanna, they taught Keyshawn and Jordan the word of God back when they were teenagers because they were running the youth group. Yeah. Yeah. They put in good, solid truth for them, and we did too. From the time they were with us as little boys. We were always in church. We were always preached in the word. We're always doing the things that we know to do, but we understand people get pulled away in life and, and you know, pursuits and, and wants and desires and things, and people get goofed up, but right now, we're just standing. We're just standing. Holy moly, I didn't know I was talking that long. Wow. Wow, I'm on page two. All right, so Paul said, behold, I tell you a secret. The Greek word is mystery. Behold, I tell you a mystery. It's mysterion in the Greek. It's a mystery. It's a, it's a secret that was not revealed prior to. Okay, so the Apostle Paul got it. Remember what the Apostle Paul said, that I went away when I was arrested on the road to Damascus. I went away into Arabia where I was taught by revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul got, got, went to school with Jesus as the teacher and, the, and, and his teaching of this end time scenario, he was told that, behold, I tell you a secret, a mystery, a mysterion of what's going to happen. And then we go into that end time scenario that we've discussed several times. Jesus tells us to watch for his return. Uh, let's see. Uh, where can I end here? Man, there's some really good stuff in these pages. You guys want to stick around for a while? We can, uh, we can, talk, about, we can talk about a lot of the stuff. Um, all right, let's go to, uh, Sam, let's go to Luke 21, 34, and then we'll, go to, uh, then we'll go to Luke 21, 36. All right, so take heed to yourselves. Jesus is speaking to everyone so that your heart doesn't get weighed down with all this stuff like carousing, drunkenness, cares of this life, that the day come on you unexpectedly. Verse 35. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. It's going to happen in instantaneously. 
that Christ will move the ch remove the church. And then at that point, we know that, that if you're still here, you need to start looking for Antichrist to rise. So it's going to be, it might not be instantaneously, but then Antichrist will rise. And when Antichrist rises and, and all the stuff about the seven years will start here. But it says that the day will, not, will, will come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those to dwell on the face of the whole earth. Verse 36. All right, here's what Jesus said. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, this is both, both Jewish and I, I think it's Christian too. So that we watch, the Bible talks about watching. We're paying attention to the signs of the times. We're paying attention to what's going on in the world. It's easy to get caught up in yourself. It's easy to get caught up in your life. It's easy to get caught up in all the things of the world. But Jesus is telling you to watch and to pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. In Luke 3, 21, 32 then, it says, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place place. All right, so uh, uh, there's one more verse. One more verse here in 2128. When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. And so that's what our encouragement is. That's my last verse from my message is that uh, to when you st start to see some of the things happening uh, begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head for your redemption draws near. And so what we're saying to every person that, first and foremost, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of his body. And the body of Christ will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so you won't be here for the last seven years. All right. So that's our hope. That's a blessed hope that Christ is going to receive us to himself. But if you know of people, or maybe right now someone came to church or you're watching with us, and you know that you haven't surrendered to Christ, you know that your life is not right and you aren't saved. Now, that's an interesting debate right now with a lot of people in the body of Christ. We won't go there. But if you aren't sure that you're saved, well, then you, gotta, you need to make that decision that you surrender to Christ. And so we're calling out for anyone that needs to, to accept the truth, to know that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. That if I continue in my rejection of the free gift of God through Jesus Christ, that as in the parable of the ten virgins, Christians hear me very, very clearly. When the bridegroom came, the five wise virgins that have oil in their lamps went into the wedding, and the door was shut. And the five unwise said, Lord, Lord, open to us. And the bridegroom said, I never knew you. God shut the door. When God gathered Noah and his family and all the animals came two by two, They didn't have drawstrings or chains to pull that giant door closed. The Bible clearly states, God shut the door. There is a day coming when Christ will come for the church and all hell's going to break loose. Planes will crash, buses will smash into walls. Cars will go crazy on the freeways and you'll realize something happened. Someone will realize that. And they'll run down to a three degrees church and they'll go, Pastor, will you pray with me to get saved? And Pastor and, and the, the friends of church aren't, aren't here. Where are they? 
Where's the church? Where's all the TV preachers? Where is everybody? They're gone. At that point, you miss what we call the rapture. You give your life to Christ anyway. And you wait. Wait for Christ from heaven when he comes back with the church. So in so many ways, it's a beautiful message of victory for the church, and it's a terrifying message for the person that isn't living for God in their life. And it's the same message from back in the 60s when I grew up to now in the 20, 2023 when, you know, we're still waiting and watching. But praise God, the grace of God has been amplified so much. God's grace is available to you. And we offer God's grace today in the form of the salvation prayer. So I'm going to say the salvation prayer right now. I'm going to ask you to say it with me for anyone that doesn't know or isn't sure if they are going to leave when Christ comes in the air. Let's say this, dear God in heaven, dear God in heaven I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for me and was raised again from the dead so that I could have eternal life. So that I could have eternal life. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior and be, be my Lord. Savior. And be my Lord. Be my Lord. <laughs> I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I receive forgiveness now. And I receive eternal life. And I thank and praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Pretty passionate, huh, Pastor Nance? It's excellent. I've got uh, years of, uh, <laughs> of studying on this subject, so. You know, I heard, I heard you explain this to someone years ago because there are different teachings, and you mentioned it today. There's a whole part of the body of Christ that doesn't even go here, right? It's almost like the book of Revelation and the signs of the times. You'd never even find it in Scripture, and yet if you just read your Bible, you're going to come across it. Why is it that when you look at uh, just churches in general, how do you know who to believe? Because there's a lot of good people that claim to preach the Bible, and yet they have different, different viewpoints. When I heard Pastor Steve say this, and I actually shared it with someone this week. If you look at the Baptists, they've always kind of been known for preaching the word, preaching the word, preaching the word, preaching the word. The Baptists believe in the catching away of the church before the tribulation. The word of faith and churches that focus on the Word of God, spirit-filled churches that have focused on the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, believe in the catching away of the church before the tribulation. So you have a more traditional denomination, not spirit-filled, but focuses on the word. And then you have denominations that are spirit-filled with an emphasis on knowing your scripture. And they agree on the pre-catching away of the church before the tribulation. And that hopefully will help you when you study it out, there is the, the most scriptures will point you to the conclusion of the catching away of the church prior to the tribulation. There is some scripture that would there's some, so churches believe in the pre-trib, mid-trib, if you've heard of that, 
the midpoint, so the three and a half years, peace, peace, rapture of the church, and then that's really when the last three and a half years of the tribulation is really when all hell breaks loose. There's some, you, you, can, you can go through scripture and you can study that out, and there's some scripture that could also align with a mid, midpoint. The least amount of any kind of evidence is for Christ, everybody gets to go through the tribulation and I believe what that what they believe is right before Jesus comes back and sets it down on the earth he takes the church so it happens like almost simultaneously which if you just think about that that doesn't doesn't seem to have a whole lot of common sense and there's very little scripture when you really understand when you understand it. This isn't a new, this is not a new doctrine by any means. Dake's Bible, I don't know when he was alive and did all that research, the Greek, and it's been around for a long time. And I just want to encourage you, study it out for yourself. Schofield's Bible is even older, the commentary. I am thankful that I have the word of God. He's not appointed me to wrath. When we live by faith, we don't have to, we're in the world, we're not of the world. We are called to rise above our circumstances. We want to be students of the word of God so that we can have every resource available to us. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. When we seek him first, you mentioned that scripture. Actually, that was part of my offering scripture today. When we seek him first, all these things are going to be added unto us. We can cast all of our cares. We don't have to worry. And the motivation that it gives to me is as the world gets crazier, as darkness gets darker, the light shines bright. We should be shining brighter, right? We have the hope of the glorious gospel. So I love, I love talking about this subject because it's important. And I think one of the reasons there's so much deception around it, too, is because if you think you're going through the tribulation, why would you want to sell out to God? What good would that do for you? If you're going to be appointed under wrath, then what does it matter? You know what I'm saying? But if you understand, like, the parable of the ten virgins and there's, you know, we want to have oil in our lamp and we want to be accounted in the five and, you know, we want to go, there's an element of the fear of the Lord that helps navigate our life. And when there are teachings and different things that are out there, you know, there's a lot of people that tell you your words don't matter. A lot of churches tell you your words don't matter. Okay. I don't know. I can't read my Bible. I'm always getting checked on my words because I talk a lot. So it's all over the Bible. The enemy always waters down. If you water down this whole thing and you begin to pick and choose what you like and what you don't like and stuff's not called sin that God calls sin and just whatever it is, man, you're in danger. We're all in danger. Whether we want to agree with it, the word of God or not, at least agree that the word of God is the truth. <laughs> wow. All right, Matthew chapter 6. Basics of Christianity is kind of what Jesus, and when I just read Matthew chapter 6, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And when you start out reading chapter 6, Jesus is talking about, you know, let your giving and your good deeds kind of be in secret. Don't don't blow your own horn 
look, I, look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. And then talks about prayer. When you pray, don't be blowing your own horn. Have a humble heart. Have the right motivation. Spend time with God. Don't be like a hypocrite. And then he goes into, you know, the, the prayer, kind of the pattern of prayer where you're praising God and you're honoring him. What's that? Taking your eyes off yourself. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Basically, you're saying, God, your, your will be done, not mine. To you be the glory. Oh, and then we got to talk about forgiveness because nothing's going to work right in your Christianity if you're holding on to un unforgiveness. And there's a lot of Christians, holy smokes, man, there's a lot of Christians who I can forgive everybody except one. They're just going to hold this little person in bondage in their own heart and head because you don't know what they did to me. You got to get to the point where you forgive so we can be fully forgiven ourselves. And then he goes back into talking about our money. Because where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and pursue money. What you're supposed to do is pursue God and master your money. You tell your money what to do. Don't let money master you. Mammon is not bad if it's not our God. We just need to be the master of our resources and tell our resources what they're going to do, right? But then he ends with, don't worry. Hmm, fear has a grip on a lot of people. They're anxious and they worry about, well, if I give and I do all these things, what's going to happen to me? God's going to take care of you. That's what's going to happen to you. Let God show you how big he is and how good he is and what he has for you. Verse 33, seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and all these things taken together will be given to you besides. So when you put God first in your life, everything else is going to fall in line. You're not when you forgive, you're not you're you're not letting people off the hook. You're giving it up to God and there's a release for you and you're letting God take care of the situation. And so all this works together. And I just find it interesting that, you know, money is the least of things Jesus said to be faithful in, and he had to talk about it twice in this very important chapter about our attitudes and what we're doing. So it is important. Pastor Steve and I don't count the offerings. We don't go through the offering because we want your offering and your giving to be between you and God. But it is important. It's an important part of our Christianity. Jesus said so. And it's one of the things that helps you be rooted where you're called. They that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of God. We want to flourish where we're planted. And so as we give today, just be encouraged. God sees your giving. He sees what you have need of already, and he's got you. He's got you. He'll take care of us. Amen? Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to give, to support the gospel, to see that, Jesus, you are lifted up and magnified in downtown Minneapolis and beyond. And we just thank you for what you're doing in the lives of every person in this church. We pray a blessing over every household. God, the things that we put our hands to, they prosper because of your favor that surrounds each one of us like a shield. God, I pray that we would be in the right place at the right time that we would always choose you, that we would strive after your kingdom first, seeking you, aiming at, and just and doing your word when we see it. Father, thank you again. We pray for these gifts, tithes, and offerings. We worship you with them now in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. John will be in the back to receive your giving. And if you are giving online, that just needs to be through our website, 3degreeschurch.com. Uh, Saturday, ladies, we're meeting here at the church for lunch at 11 o'clock. Please sign up. And we're just asking people who are able to, to bring something to share. Um, you'll see on the list what we've already got coming. So if you are able to make it, please sign up so we make sure we don't have all dessert, although that would be fun. But um, I have the main dish, but anyway. All right, bless you. Have a great holiday week, and we will see you on Wednesday night.